Video from the Texas Department of Public Safety Saturday show the current situation under the International Bridge in Del Rio, Texas, where more than 14,000 migrants have gathered across crossing illegally into the United States. U.S. Border Patrol Chief Raul Ortiz says that there are currently 12,600 migrants under the bridge in Del Rio. And NBC News reports that more than 10,000 mainly Haitian migrants were part of the new surge. Over the weekend, Texas Governor Greg Abbott announced that the Texas DPS was in full force in the area in conjunction with the Texas National Guard. DPS thanked the governor for, quote, allowing Texas to step up where the federal government has failed. Uh, so what, what's, what's, the US's, what's the U.S. thinking here? So it, from our perspective, we can uh, destabilize and undermine the country of Haiti for 200 plus years. Uh, leave it in a situation where it's borderline uninhabitable, Ga you know, gangs filling power vacuums uh, le left by coup after coup after coup supported by the Uni United States. People then flood out of that country, a very predictable, uh, a very predictable outcome of, of our policy toward Haiti. And we're upset that they're coming our way. I mean, if, if if, if we want people to, you know, stay in Haiti, then we should make Haiti a, a we, sh we shouldn't actively make Haiti a less habitable place, is my take. Well, a couple of things. I mean, certainly the U.S. has played a role in the domestic politics of Haiti, but we've also given uh, millions of dollars in international aid. Yet to, they've not to oligarchs who then steal it. That's fair, but this is a country that's been unable to deal with systemic corruption, widespread poverty, and the U.S. has aided them. Now, I would say this. This is a much bigger macro question of how we deal with the issue on the border. I'm somebody who's pro-border security, but also thinks we vastly need to reform our immigration laws. We need to make it easier to come into this, the country legally. We also need to look at the fact that Haiti just suffered another major natural disaster. They also faced, obviously, the assassination of their president. So this is an incredibly destabilized time in that country. What is the legal option that we could give that could help people who are fleeing uninhabitable uh, terms within the country? And I don't think that we're seeing any proposals. So what we have is this humanitarian crisis unfolding. We can't ignore that it's also a public health crisis. We're in the midst of a pandemic. And on top of that, we can't ignore that it could potentially be a national security one. Yeah. We, we, we assume that most of these are Haitians, but you don't know where people could have come from or whether you have cartels involved, et cetera, um, all of which seems to be being, you know, not really dealt with by the federal government and now being left in the hands of Texans. Right. Well, the, the legal uh, regime would be TPS, temporary protected status, which ought to just become protected status. Well, I, I, but the question that arises there, and I'm somebody who's been in favor of TPS for Venezuelans as the country's been massive massively destabilized. You know, you have massive um, food shortages, uh, with people living in just terrible conditions. But the question becomes, every there are so many countries in South America, a place that has struggled over the, the last decades, um, that at what point do we say you can't all come here? What, right. what, what is the assistance that we can provide that's reasonable? And what can we do to actually assist these countries in bringing back, um, you know, Venezuela at one time right. was one of the most prosperous nations in the region, in the Western Hemisphere, and now is devastated. Right. The willingness to extend protected status to Venezuela and Cuba, but not other countries, uh, shows just how political the entire process is, if, if you ask me. But so single adult men will reportedly be expelled via Title 42. But most family units will be processed and released into the U.S. with notice to appear. And according to internal documents obtained by NBC News, ICE plans to fly eight deportation flights to Haiti and will then increase that number to 10 per week. A few deportation flights just restarted in the past few days in response to the surge. According to another document, ICE will also begin, quote, lateral flights in which Haitian migrants will be flown to other sectors of the U.S., uh, border for processing in order to alleviate overcrowding in Del Rio. Uh, isn't it isn't it interesting that we're having this this uh, crisis at the border at the same time that you have businesses all over the country complaining that they can't find workers? Like, wh where's the dissonance? come there. Like, so we don't have enough workers. Uh, we're, we're broke. We, we're going to have to actually give people raises. Oh, no. Uh, and then here come thousands of people, you know, looking, f looking for work and looking for a better life. And we're like, no, let's let's get them uh, charter flights 
and send them back to the, 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 the awful conditions that they just fled. This, I mean, this goes back to reforming the legal process for getting into the country. We should make it easier to get in, even if it's for temporary worker statuses. But again, the, the, the 10 million unfilled jobs in the U.S., um, those could be, or I'm sorry, 10 million unemployed Americans in the U.S., they, those, those jobs should be filled by Americans. Um, my, my question would be, you know, the reason that many aren't getting back into the workforce is because the, the aid that they're getting from the federal government is actually more than, that they, than they would be making in the workforce, which in and of itself is kind of a self-perpetuating cycle of unemployment that we're carrying on in our own country. But, but with, this, with this issue, I mean, we, Vice President Harris went to the border. Um, uh, Secretary Mayorkas has gone there a number of times to sort of survey the damage and the situation. And it, it is wildly inhumane, even for, for liberals in the White House who do believe in open borders and who were advocating for the mass amnesty to be included in the reconciliation package. How do they look at what's happening right now, where you have 14,000 people camped out under a bridge without adequate food, water coverage, any of that, and just say, you know, we're just going to deport them back. That, to me, seems inhumane. I, I actually think in some ways it's better to secure the border, not make it an option for them to make this long and arduous journey north, and start reforming a legal process for them to come into the country. Is that a conversation that's being had with Democrats? Uh, no, because, I mean, it's, it's also just impossible. Like, you can't—there's there, there, there's no type of security uh, that you're going to be able to build in—you know, if you, if you look at a— the globe, like we are a massive place. There are there there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles that people can go to to try to get in. So as as long as the effort to get in is less risky and less dangerous than the current uh, life that they're living every single day, people are going to continue to try. And so. Uh, you know, like people have said, you build a build a 20 foot wall. There, somebody will find a 21 foot ladder, or you know, people. You know, these walls fall over. You, you dig under the walls. Mm. Like, there's there's the only thing that you're really doing is increasing the risk for the people who are who are trying to migrate. Uh, better would be to actually say, you know what, we're one big planet. Let's 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 figure this out in a in a more in a more humane way. Well, just one thing I would note real quick is. Um, Something that I think anyone has to weigh, whether you're an immigration hardliner on the right or an open borders liberal on the left or somewhere in between, is, is taking into account how bad things must be that somebody chooses to make this journey north. And, and a remarkable statistic from DHS is that one in three women who make that journey, women and girls, will be subject to sexual assault. Mm -hmm. And they're willing to take that risk knowing it. They're willing to pay coyotes to take their children to come. So this is a very complex issue where I think we have to talk about what are these root causes of corruption in these countries? Is our international aid doing anything? Because I would revisit right. that if we're sending tens of millions of dollars, yet these countries are as corrupt as they've ever been and people are massively fleeing, then that's a conversation we need to have. Um, but again, I, I don't see that being had in Washington right now. Right. And as Richard Holbrook said of Afghanistan, but it's true in Central and South America, the U.S. is the root of the corruption. Like our money is, is what is corrupting. Like our decisions of who we give money to and to continue to give money and continue to give money to is, is what drives the corruption. It's, uh, it, you know, either that or we are the least competent uh, people on the face of the planet in the history of humanity. Like, like for, it's been happening for 70, you know, since let's, depending on where you want to start post World War II, what are the chances uh, that just by fl a fluke we would be constantly fueling the most corrupt, most despicable think, people if it were not intentional? I if think it, and it's, it's not hard. intentional, it's utter, like the, the most rank and hilarious incompetence you it's, can imagine. I do think it's hard to paint with a broad brush, though. So you look at some places like Colombia, and President Duque has made some significant anti-corruption reforms um, a, per, compared to his predecessor and still has a long way to come. But then you have places like Venezuela, where we have actively tried to support the actual legitimate elected leader, um, which is going nowhere. Um, and he's uh, Maduro still clings on to pow power. And you have the Chinese and you have the Russians investing in those countries, you certainly can't put it all in the feet of the U.S. I think that there's a lot of meddling in the Western Hemisphere from outside forces that um, contributes to the destabilization and the, the success of human traffickers and cartels and the like. Although Guaido hasn't really been elected yet. Um, you know, there, he has by the National Assembly. The National Assembly, yes. but right. Yeah. So uh, former Homeland Security Secretary under Obama, Jay Johnson, uh, had this to say about what's happening at the border. 
We have to get control of our, our borders. 200,000 a month is a lot of people. DHS just released the numbers for August. It's 200,000. August mm -hmm. is typically a month where it's very low. Right. And because of the heat in the, mm -hmm. in the summertime, uh, it, usually the, num the numbers flowing in, uh, you know, really, you know, ra go ramp down in the summer and then come back up in the winter and the spring. I think that we're seeing a new normal, though. Like the, you know, with, with, with the with economic inequality that has exploded over the last 20 years, plus uh, climate collapse and, and the corruption and the resulting de destabilization, I think this is what we're, we're going to be seeing um, for the rest of our lives. Yeah, but I don't think we can ignore that President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris more or less said, come here, when they were campaigning. They, they, they indicated to anyone who wants to migrate to the U.S. that they would eventually be given amnesty, and I think that's incentivized a lot of people coming who think that this is their shot to do it. Um, and they are thinking of, you know, Republicans may take hold of the House, they may not have a Democrat in office in 2024, and this is a window. But one other thing we have to take into account while looking at this is we're also dealing with the crisis in Afghanistan and relocating potentially tens of thousands of Afghan interpreters to this country. And I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of doing so. I think that they've, you know, if they've served alongside U.S. forces, we should absolutely give them refugee status here. So again, it goes back to this question of can we be home to everyone? I, I mean, there, there's got to be a point if you've got 200,000 people coming a month over the southern border, we're trying to relocate tens of thousands of Afghans to the U.S., where do we draw the line? Where do we prioritize who needs to come in? And, and I haven't seen that spelled out quite yet. But a Dallas Morning News University of Texas Tyler poll found that Joe Biden's approval rate among Texas Hispanics is taking a nosedive, down 19 points to a 35 percent approval rate and a 54 percent approval rate. The poll also found that among te Texas Hispanics, Biden's handling of the U.S.-Mexico border is 18 points underwater at a 29 percent approval rating and a 47 percent disapproval rating. So to me, this is, this is kind of obvious for a number of reasons, is any of those border towns that are the major sectors of transport for people illegally coming in, this devastates them financially, economically. Um, there's also the fear of crime associated with people coming over. So I, I, it does not shock me if you're a, Texas, a Hispanic Texas uh, resident living in one of those border towns that you're thinking, I did it the legal way. Why are these people not doing it? But your thoughts? Or even if they didn't do it the legal yeah. way, <laughs> like, like uh, you know, although many many of them, um, uh, there, there was an extra legal process by which they became Americans in the sense that their families were there for you know many generations and were there when it was Mexico, were there when it was the Republic of Texas, and then and then were there when it became the United States. So rather than them moving across borders, the borders right. kind of moved moved across uh, moved across them, and so you do have the the, the political resentment that's that. That's con and that's connected with, uh, you know, the different generations of, of migrants. You you've, you've seen that with Germans, Italians, Irish, etc. Et you know, and down on the line. It was something we we found during the Trump administration that I was somewhat surprised by. But yes, um, Hispanics living in the country now who legally immigrated or through their families in previous generations did tended to be more in favor of securing the border. Doesn't necessarily mean, necessarily mean the wall. I think there's plenty of reasons to understand that a wall might not be the best means to do it. Um, but because they had gone through the legal process, they'd also understood the safety that comes with having a secure border because of the corruption, the crime, the cartels that could be on the other side of it. Yes, Democrats definitely do paint with too broad and lazy a brush when it, when it comes to that, to that question, for sure. And we cool. will have more rising after this.